As the time arrives for my presentation, I'm afraid I've been diagnosed with COVID-19. So if my presentation lacks a certain dynamism or precision, I very much hope you will allow me to apologise. Even so, I'm sure I can show that the ridiculous notion of artificial intelligence is nothing more than a myth. The greatest threat to humanity is artificial intelligence. It is going to take over our jobs, take over our lives, and render us all obsolescent. At least, that is what its practitioners would have you believe. Today I'm going to start by looking at the history of this subject and come to the present day to conclude that they're wrong. It hasn't happened, it couldn't happen, it won't happen. The ridiculous claims for AI actually refer to something far more basic and much easier to understand. What we experience as intelligence is nowhere involved. Today I will show how our ideas of human and artificial intelligence are based on ignorance amongst its practitioners and are misplaced. The world is being compromised by a dream no more real than the monsters we fared as children and the ghosts and spirits that our antecedents once worshipped. We are, ladies and gentlemen, being conned. So let me take you back to the beginning to discover where science went wrong. Ever since the birth of fanciful ideas on artificial life in Mary Shelley's Frankenstein, published in 1833, there have been science fiction novels that extend the reader's imagination into improbable realms. And they are everywhere, of course, in the modern era. But the first person to study the subject in its contemporary academic context was Alan Turing. And this is the standard picture of him that is usually published. I have now discovered that there are others. Here is Turing at school, aged 18. This rare picture was originally in the archives of Sherborne School in the west of England, where he was a pupil. But in 1984 it was stolen by an American scholar and taken to Colorado. She actually changed her name to Julia Turing and acted as if they were related. This photo recently came to light once more in Colorado and a court action has now decided it must be returned to Sherborne. Though first it must be sanctioned by the Department for Internal Affairs and afterwards it may have to pass through the Department of State. It's a curious story to mark the birth of AI. And how good was Turing at Sherborne School? Not very successful as a pupil, it would appear. His essays were said to be grandiose beyond his abilities and his English marks were unimpressive. Turing's French prose was very weak, though as you can see, his poor showing in chemistry was beginning to improve. This school report was exhibited by the Fitzwilliam Museum in Cambridge and it shows that his mathematical promise was betrayed because he wasn't always intelligible or even legible. Alan Turing is commemorated as the pioneer who first cracked the Nazis' Enigma code. But none of that is true. The Enigma machine was invented when Turing was just a tiny baby. It was on mail order and sold widely around the world. Tens of thousands of them were made. They were later picked up by the German military, but they were not decoded first by Turing. The original decoding was done by Polish cryptographers, of whom nowadays we hear nothing. The truth of the fact is that the story we're told is very different from what actually happened. Enigma was a rotor-based encryption machine, and this idea was originally the brainchild of two Netherlands engineers in the Dutch Ministry of War back in 1915. The principle of rotary encryption was first developed by these two ingenious naval officers. One was Theo van Hengel, and the other was his friend RPC Sprengler. They envisaged an encryption device in which interchangeable rotors could be used to alter the encryption at will, making it virtually impossible for an interceptor to decode. They never built their device, and the idea was eventually patented in 1919 by someone said to be a colleague of theirs, Hugo Alexander Koch, that he never built the machine either. Meanwhile, in America, while 
Van Hengel and Sprengler were working on their approach to the problem, an Illinois inventor named Edward Hayburn patented his own design in 1918. And here is his device. It was the first successful rotary encryption machine and a significant step in our story. It was so very ingenious, but Hebern couldn't interest anyone in his ideas. He set up a company with over a thousand employees, but it was never a success. And by 1926, he filed for bankruptcy. But the spectacular building he constructed stands to this day. It's in Oakland, California, and it is the first building in history devoted to the making of these supremely efficient encryption machines. In many ways, this is the founding factory of the era of AI. The person who made rotary encryption machines a success was this German inventor, Arthur Scherbius. He developed the idea and patented the device that has its well-known place in the history of encryption. His idea was the Enigma machine. It was packed into a wooden box and so could easily be transported. A set of rotors substituted encoded characters for what was typed and the rotors could easily be switched around. In this way, the inventor was confident that the code could never be cracked. We're always taught that the Enigma machine was the proud development of the Nazis, but it was in existence long before that. The machine was marketed internationally as the answer to industrial espionage. Its powerful encryption meant that commercial secrets could be kept safe from prying eyes. Throughout the 20s, it was widely purchased internationally and generally available. In contrast to Hebern's failure to attract interest, it made its inventor a lot of money. And records suggest that after it went on sale in 1923, over 37,000 Enigma machines were sold. Some 25 different versions were produced, of which about 280 are known to exist today. The army of Hungary bought them, and so did the Swiss and the Netherlands armed forces. Then the Germany military began to use them too, and as the Nazis' expansionist policies began to emerge, their worried neighbours, the Poles, set out to find ways of cracking their codes. The brilliant Maximilian Czerski at the Polish Cipher Bureau made the breakthrough by realising that these codes could not be broken by the traditional linguistic approach which was the way the British codebreakers always worked. It could only be sold by mathematics and machines. The era of the computer was about to be born. Henrik Zygalski, at the Cypher Bureau in Warsaw, devised a system of perforated sheets to help crack the Enigma codes. His colleague, Marian Rejewski, set out to design the first electromechanical device which could mimic the encryption of an Enigma machine and work out the code. Jeje Uyetsky worked with Ryevsky on constructing a pioneering device based on the limited documents they found smuggled out of Germany by French intelligence. Their machine meant that the German secret messages were being understood all the time. The German forces were convinced nobody could break their code, but the Poles were already finding a way. As the Germans began to plan for the invasion of Poland, that would herald the start of World War II, the Polish engineers were using their device to read all those secret messages. And they soon realised that their work would surely be discovered, so they decided to hand everything over at a meeting with French and British intelligence officials. Nobody knows what their bomber really looked like. Everything the Poles had, they destroyed before the Germans could uncover what had been achieved. But this is an artist's impression based on contemporaneous accounts. Nobody really knows why it was ever called the Bomber. It was said to have been named after the research group's favourite treat that they used to enjoy after work. And here it is. This is an ice cream Bomber. Nobody knows for sure, though it would have been the perfect name in one sense. Nobody overhearing a conversation could ever have guessed what the word meant. As the Germans planned to occupy Poland, and their intentions were decoded by the Poles, the cryptographers used this route to escape from Warsaw. Many of them moved to the south of France, while a small group came to England.
And so it is that the Polish codebreakers came to bring their top secret research to Bletchley Park here in the heart of England. Though the Polish workers' research is always downplayed. Come with me to Bletchley Park and let's see how the British experts are lauded over their brave and ingenious Polish pioneers who originally came up with the bomber. The captions play down the Polish initiative, which had already found out how to crack the code, while elevating the role of the British. The bomb, which the Poles invented, and it was then later improved here by Turing. That's history, but not according to the caption. This says how Turing and Welshman designed the bomb to speed up code breaking. Before the war, the Poles had produced an earlier version, but theirs is much more sophisticated. Designed by Turing and Collings at Bletchley Park. Amazing. Probably named by the Poles, who invented the precursor to the bomb we see here. This doesn't mean that we should underestimate the coruscating brilliance of Turing and his team at Bletchley Park. The machines they designed and built were remarkably efficient and more elaborate than those built by the pioneering Poles. Working replicas of the British bomber have been built and are demonstrated to this day at Bletchley Park. The complexity of the decoding machines had to keep pace with the Germans, who were developing improved versions of Enigma, each one more complex than the last. However, for all the brilliance of the Bletchley team, the fact remains that it was the Polish cryptologists who first worked out how to do it, although our laundered view of history has virtually removed their names from the accepted account. The Poles were not alone in having a fascination for electrical devices that could help decode complex problems. Already a computer was being constructed, but that wasn't in Britain, it wasn't in America, it wasn't in Poland. No, the world's first computer was being already assembled in Germany. This was done by an aircraft technician and amateur enthusiast in Berlin, Konrad Zusa. His computer used punched paper tape as input. I was still using that in the 1960s, and it had Boolean logic in his programs. He also invented Plan Calcul, Plan Calculus, the world's first computer programming language. His Z1 computer had a clock speed of 1 hertz but it boasted a simple control unit and memory. Zeus had tried to interest the military and commercial companies, but nobody showed any interest. I discussed much of this in a recent book. His prototypes and drawings were all destroyed by the Allied bombing in 1943. But at the same time in Britain and America, people had been building robots. Harry May in London had demonstrated an autonomous robot named Alpha. Then the American Westinghouse Corporation demonstrated their robot they named Electro in 1939. And so, ladies and gentlemen, with a great deal of pride and pleasure, I present to you Electro, the Westinghouse Moto Man. Stop. You see, all I need to do is to speak into this phone, and Electro does exactly what I tell him to do. You may now smoke this cigarette. Oh, yes, Electro, you do need a light, too, don't you? All right, here you are. And, folks, he's only two years old, too. Just learning. So the idea of artificial intelligence was already current in the 1930s. And yet it didn't stem biological progression from what went before. No, it was due to hubris, to exaggeration. It was underpinned by an overwhelming desire by those involved in the research to overstate their work, to exaggerate their findings, and to claim an unrealistic future that could serve only to make their own work seem more exciting and more propitious than any research that was going on anywhere else. They were after global fame and status, and that's why they overstated everything that they hoped to achieve. In my two books on the subject, Nonchance that came out in 71, and uh, Nonchance Returns, which was issued 50 years later, 
I have described these people as experts. Individuals who use overconfident expressions and hyperbole to promote a wishful utopia that reality cannot ever match. Five years after the Second World War, Turing published a widely quoted paper asking whether machines could create intelligence. It was an attempt to dignify his remarkable success by extrapolation to an absurd degree. At the same time in Bristol, England, another experimenter was creating robots that he claimed were as intelligent as a two-celled living organism. In a simple villa on the outskirts of Bristol lives Dr. Gray Walter, a neurologist, who makes robots as a hobby. They are small and he doesn't dress them up to look like men. He calls them tortoises. This model is named Elsie and she sees out of a photoelectric cell which rotates above her body. When light strikes the cell, driving and steering mechanism sends her hurrying towards it. But if she brushes against any object in her path, contacts are operated that turn the steering away. Dr. Walter says that his electronic toys work exactly as though they have a simple two-cell nervous system. To equate an electrically powered toy with the majesty and choreographed complexity of a living cell is a ridiculous exaggeration. Yet there are billions of dollars worth of research all around the world which claims to have achieved just that. It is all a blatant untruth. The idea that our machinery could emulate human intelligence was being widely promoted. And by 1956, there was the first gathering of artificial intelligence enthusiasts held at Dartmouth College in New Hampshire, an Ivy League university that predates the American Revolution. Here is an interesting group of some who were there, photographed in 2006. Trenchard Moore, on the left, was a distinguished computer scientist from Boston, Massachusetts, who worked on AI in its earliest years at MIT, in Canada and in Denmark. John McCarthy, next to Moore, is the man who thought up the term artificial intelligence in 1956. He worked at Stanford University as a cognitive scientist and helped develop programming languages, including Algol, which I remember using in the 60s. Marvin Minsky was based at the Massachusetts Institute of Technology, where he co-founded their AI laboratory. In 1967, he wrote, Within a generation, the problem of creating artificial intelligence will be substantially solved. Oliver Selfridge was a leading English computer scientist whose grandfather founded the famous Selfridge's store in London. He wrote several papers in the late 1950s, which are regarded as founding documents in the study of AI. And finally, the spectacularly bearded Ray Solomonoff studied under Enrico Fermi at the University of Chicago and first became obsessed with automated problem solving in his teens. He circulated a paper on non-semantic machine learning in 1956 and later worked with McCarthy and Minsky on AI. These five were photographed in 2006 to celebrate the conference where it had all begun. 1956 is when the term artificial intelligence formally emerged as a scientific discipline. It is also where they all went wrong from the start. This commemorative plaque immortalises the greatest single conceptual conundrum that has confused the computer community ever since. Their mission statement, if you will, launched the biggest lie of all, namely that computers can emulate human intelligence. They cannot, and they never will. The error lies in claiming to proceed on the basis of the conjecture that every aspect of learning or any other feature of intelligence can in principle be so precisely described that a machine can be made to simulate it. That is simply wrong. And the error lies in the phrase learning or any other feature of intelligence. Learning is not a feature of intelligence. It never has been. You may see somebody on a, a quiz program on TV who gets all the answers right. And people say, my, mustn't they be intelligent? But no, it isn't intelligence. The person has a perfect memory, an eidetic memory for names and facts and figures and images. 
but that is not the same as intelligence. Computers can learn as much as you want, but intelligence is something they cannot display. Let's look at these definitions of intelligence over the years. In 1905, the ability to learn or understand or deal with new or trying situations, to resolve genuine problems, to think rationally. Let's pick out the important words. To deal with new situations, to resolve genuine problems, to deal with the environment, problem-solving skills, to deal with new situations, adaptability to new problems. And therein lies the problem. Intelligence resides in finding answers to unforeseen problems. That's not the same as memory. It's not the same as factual recall. It isn't the same as ingenuity. And yet even single cells can exceed our abilities when it comes to manipulative skill and ingenious behaviour. Here is a display of table lamps on a market stall. They're attractive and unusual. They are made by cementing tiny fragments of translucent material together with meticulous care to create a flask shape. Here is one, about 250 millimetres long, all meticulously fitted together with diligence and skill. It's not a perfect example. As you can see, there is at least one tiny segment missing. But clearly, someone needed a great deal of human ingenuity to construct something so delicate. So here is a comparable example of something remarkably similar. This one has no flaws, and it is considerably more complicated. It was painstakingly assembled, not by an ingenious crafter in a factory, but this is a shell home constructed by a single-celled amoeba, no bigger than a pinprick. The organism is called Nebula collaris, and here is another example. Making these homes for themselves is an astonishing achievement for a single-celled organism. Those artificial intelligence people have often tried to create a living type of robot that can emulate what those cells can do. But believe me, they haven't even come close. There is nothing digital or electronic or human-produced in the so-called living robots that have been reported. The research has been done at the University of Vermont with Tufts University and the Institute for Biologically Inspired Engineering at Harvard. And they take a petri dish of toad blastulas, the first stage of the developing embryo, and break them apart using forceps in some of the crudest, most amateurish micro manipulation that I have ever seen. When filmed in time lapse with a pretty low grade system, it must be said, the battered but indefatigable cell groups continue to move. The boastful experimenters say they have created living xenobots that can actually reproduce. In fact, it's these embryos that are teaching the scientists a lesson. They simply prove that no matter how much they're torn apart and battered about, they can still adapt to it and carry on living their complex lives. To pretend that the scientists have somehow created living robots is utterly bizarre. Experts have been making these absurd claims for decades. Here is an article I wrote on the topic in 1967. I quote a headline from the Sunday Times of London with research teams claiming that they had just created man-made life. That's more than 50 years ago. Solid-state digital systems are what we now use to control so many aspects of our busy lives. And they are controlled by algorithms. But humans don't think like that. Our way of approaching life is heuristic. Algorithms are sequential. The kind of algorithms that control aircraft, social media, ships and financial decision making lay down a strict sequence of rules that are painstakingly compiled by computer technicians or mathematicians. Note, not necessarily by pilots, sociologists, captains or bankers, but by youngsters who may lack any experience or understanding of the outside world. Little wonder that planes inexplicably crash, that social media sites unwittingly promote aggression or confrontation, that ships mysteriously collide, or that banking systems totally collapse. It's not the fault of the computers. It's the fault of the people who wrote the algorithms 
the kids who are in charge. Nobody ever questions whom they might be. One of the more familiar applications of what they call AI is robotics. This is a site with which everyone is familiar. The cybernetic software can be configured to learn and memorize precise positions and meticulous movements in sequences of predetermined actions. Here we are speculating whether robots will take over our jobs in a world where that very process has already come true. The fear of humans being supplanted by intelligent robotic machines is the theme of this year's Reese Lectures by Professor Stuart Russell from the BBC. Pretending that this is a current crisis and a novel notion is nonsense. It's preoccupied people for over three centuries. For thousands of years, diligent artisans have been creating fabulous fabrics and intricate lacework, moving threads by eye and hand, setting them carefully in juxtaposition to provide us with artistic perfection. This isn't new. People were weaving complex patterns into carpets in the Iron Age, and probably far earlier. This all changed in the late 1700s when mechanical weaving emerged. An ingenious French businessman, Joseph-Marie Jacquard, invented an automatic loom which could carry complex patterns fed into it through a system of punched cards. It won him a bronze medal at the Exposition des Produits de l'Industrie Française held in 1801 in Paris. His looms could produce vast lengths of intricately patterned fabric without the need for individual labour at all. The first person recorded as an objector to this loss of livelihood was Ned Ludd, who was said to have destroyed an early mechanical loom in 1779. He was a fictitious character, though the protests were real enough. If you go to see a present-day loom at work, you will observe how little has changed. Yes, the patterns are now controlled by computer code, rather than punched cards, but the principle is unaltered. We all expect to have washing machines to clean our clothes. Many have dishwashers to manage the crockery and cutlery. Pretending that there might be modern methods of doing away with personal effort is nothing new. Watching a jacquard loom at work reminds us that it is the ingenuity of innovators that saves as much of the manual labour that once we had to employ. Now we face the threat of artificial intelligence controlling weaponry. A familiar sight is the drone, controlled by a technician thousands of miles away in the comfort of his office. But the drone is nothing new. It was the Germans who started drone warfare in World War II. Their V1 fell onto its target when its sensors detected that it had flown a prescribed distance. Today's drones look remarkably similar, though they now have computerised control systems to enable them to home in precisely on their target. Commentators look towards an era of computer-controlled robotic weapons, but that era has been with us for years. The claim is they can identify specific individuals or a person of a specified age and kill them at will. None of this is remotely intelligent. It's just the application of digital automation, which militarists expect to harness in the modern world. It certainly isn't new. It's long been taught that King Herod ordered the slaughter of children over 2,000 years ago. He said that they should be male and aged two or under, a possibly mythical event portrayed here by Piero in the 15th century. So selecting your victim by age or gender is nothing new. It's just that now we can automate the process. This automation has nothing to do with intelligence. Whenever people talk to me about uh, supercomputers, they say, yes, but they can do things no human can ever achieve. Well, so can a stapler. Here is a robotic head constructed by the Engineered Arts Company. It tilts like a person. Its eyes move like a person's eyes. Its face has expressions that seem to change with mood. It's a realistic robot. Yet none of this has anything to do with artificial intelligence. It's a doll. It's a wonderfully ingenious demonstration, and personally I cannot wait to see how this technology is going to develop in future. But intelligence has nothing to do with it. We are not creating a synthetic human. 
Yet the absurdity of the Saudi authorities granting citizenship to a robot made by Hanson Robotics, which they named Sophia, and which I described last year, demonstrates how gullible people have become. Sophia is just a doll, larger and more sophisticated than those we give to our children, but a doll nonetheless. Granting this digital machine citizenship had a certain irony to it. The robot Sophia enjoyed rather more privileges and social freedom in Saudi Arabia than the female citizens of that country. And yet still people are unnerved by the sight and are convinced that in some strange way humans are about to become replaced by machines. They aren't. Let's look back at a somewhat dated article I published on the very topic of computers when I mentioned the claim that they can do something no human can do. I said, certainly one cannot deny the fact that computers can do very much more than a man, but so can a pencil or a screwdriver, as can an aeroplane, pin or easy chair. That article was published in 1968 more than half a century ago. We have passed through eras when humans invented the plough, harnessed animals, put water to work for us, moved on to create the Industrial Revolution in Britain with the invention of steam power, then the internal combustion engine, the introduction of electricity. There has been a steady progress towards mechanisation and automation as long as society has existed. And now we have digital automation. It's nothing to do with artificial intelligence. It is simply automation, something that's been familiar to us for decades, in many ways for centuries. It is automation, digitised automation that depends on machine learning. But that is not intelligence. If you want to see ingenious, dynamic, intelligent single cells, then look down a microscope and watch microbes at work. Observe them, exploring their environment, peering through ruby eye spots at the outside world, pausing to digest what they've experienced, then deciding where to go next and what to do, absorbing energy from sunlight and metabolizing what they need to live in systems of incalculable complexity. The youngsters who write algorithms, like you, were never shown any of this at school. As these microscopic organisms live their intricate little lives, fueling themselves without external mediation, hunting for food, we can begin to understand what intelligence is and where it truly resides. Those young programmers think they are mastering artificial intelligence since they have never ever been presented with sites like these. Throughout my studies of the intelligent behaviour of living cells, I have repeatedly demonstrated their astonishing capacity for decision-making and the subtlety of their capacity for ingenuity. It abounds in life, just as speed, precision and efficiency are characteristic of the astonishing achievements that we can make through the use of our digital computers. After the ages of domesticated animals and steam power, the internal combustion engine and the introduction of electrical energy, we are now in the era of computerised automation. Call it advanced cybernetics if you wish to impress outsiders. The systems which apply artificial intelligence today are the one place where the one thing you will never find is any sign of intelligence. <laughs>